welcome to another episode of the Hotspur Huddle, where we have a lot of different things to kind of dissect tonight, including those Champions League games from last night and tonight. And with me to do it, as per usual, every week, I'm joined by the fabulous Wes and Nelson. So Wes, first of all, how are you this evening? Yeah, I'm all good. I'm all good. Um, obviously, watched my mate Harry um, last night. Um, so yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting... Um, watch shall we say um but yeah all, yeah all good um looking forward to the show as always because it is the best uh best youtube show out there i'm gonna throw it out there put it there i've said it now so I yeah no it. as always looking forward to it so yeah should be good lot to go through as well so yeah it should be should be really really interesting for the uh boys and girls out there indeed and nelson as well i'm hoping you're feeling a little bit better after uh last night obviously seeing harry kane score a penalty and then you know the thing that happened later on which i'm sure we'll get into but how are you nelson i'm doing good holly um excited to be back here um obviously i wasn't here last week as well but it's good to be back and just talking things all football so we'll get into that a bit later i know my heart's a bit bruised but we'll get into that um i did see wes's mate harry yesterday you know not bad but uh, i have a little word of him but you know let, let's get things cracking indeed indeed like i said we've got a lot to dissect uh make sure you people that are watching live now make sure you get your comments in uh but as we always say the night show is uh obviously sponsored by the amazing kofa so we're gonna let you do your thing hit it hit it my friend yeah, so Kofa or Kickoff Football Academy, um, Milton Keynes um, is a football coaching business um, in the Milton Keynes area, Delhi Alley Country, for people that do not know where it is. Um, we run lots and lots of different football sessions, as you can see on screen, with one to ones, kickers, football camps, birthday parties, etc. So if you have a young boy or girl that is looking to add to their football repertoire, then please get in touch, um, as we would really, really like to help them lovely stuff so make sure you go check out Hofa um and let's get straight into it because I always want an opportunity to talk about Mickey van der Ven and Wes I'm going to come to you first uh because my words he scored a whiz bomber at the weekend and I keep watching it over and over again yeah absolute whiz bomber um but actually I think we also need to talk about the technique from Pedro Porro for Pedro Porro's goal because that was outrageous um from a fullback to kind of have the bit of side swaz as we would say in the trade um, it was really, really good. But no, that strike from Van der Ven took it like a, a centre forward, really. And it was nice that somebody just went, sod it, I'm just going to twat it in the goal. Um, obviously, because the West Ham game, as we all know, was really frustrating because we got into some really nice areas in and around the box. And I think we have done all season, but nobody just wants to have a shot. And it's been really frustrating for us as fans because we like, just shoot, man, for God's sake. Um, and no one's really done it. So, yeah, it was nice that Mickey just went, sod it, I'll have a go. Um, and my word, what a, what a finish it was as well. Um, so, yeah, I was obviously watching it at home and kind of when it happened, I was like, wow. OK, I think I turned into like full Gary Neville, like, oh, that kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, no, I think Mickey has been an incredible sign-in for, for Spurs um generational talent um for me and he has literally transformed i wouldn't say our back line but he's transformed how we probably view defenders now um so i think for a long time we were after the sort of yan vatongan replacement i think we found him but then also upgraded on yan in certain elements as well obviously with with mickey's pace um, and things like that i think yan was more of an organiser and would read situations really well, whereas Van der Ven kind of is is good at that. Don't get me wrong, um, but I think he's obviously a little bit more obviously rapid, so you know he can get away with being out of position a little bit more because of his pace. And I think the partnership that he struck up with with Cootie Romero at the back is uh, is definitely up there for me in terms of the one of the best in in the league. So. Yeah, what a what a player, what a guy. Um, he just absolutely and he loves Tottenham. He just loves being there, and I think. That's what Andrew was almost trying to say in his press conference before the game, uh, like on the Friday, saying like, "Look, I only want to sign players that actually want to be playing for Tottenham. Not they're they're not here because we're in the Champions League and and everything else." So no, he's been a he's been an incredible sign, an incredible player, and yeah, what a, what a guy, what a geezer. He is indeed. And obviously I love him because I call him Daddy Longlegs. Um, but I don't want to talk about Mickey Van der Ven all night because I probably would. Um, and Nelson, obviously Wes has mentioned Champions League. Now, I know for you last night, you were lucky enough to play in the game. Uh, how did you kind of feel uh, after the result, to say the least? Obviously it finished 2-2. Um, 
I was quite disappointed with the results, considering that I think obviously me and Wes was actually chatting back and forth between the game. And Wes made a really good point about how, you know, we started off really well in the game. However, the problem was that as a team, we sort of kind of were in the moment rather than in the game. And I think that allowed Bayern to, pre you know, they presented themselves and really actually set up really well to um, counter press against us. And I think you have to give Tuchel credit because um, Tuchel's done a lot of work. Or I think he was actually mentally prepared for this game. I know in the league they haven't been really good this season. Leverkusen are going to win the title uh, very soon. But um, I was really impressed with how Bayern set up. And I think the second half was when it showed. I think Tuchel won the first half. But I think Arteta, with his changes, um, made some really good changes that helped Arsenal come back in the game. I was quite baffled when Tuchel actually took off Sane to begin with because that left Nabry obviously the only kind of wide winger that could pose a threat and then Nabry came off injured so then obviously the threat the threats out wide were, were, were basically nullified and gone and were void and I think that allowed Arsenal to kind of actually press Bayern a bit more um, and obviously they got the equaliser in the end but um, Bayern did create their chances but I think when you look at the overall game I think Arsenal did well to stay in the game and I think we dominated possession. I think when you look at the goals back again, they were gifts. They were gifts essentially that we gave to to, to Bayern. Um, but obviously at the end of the day, this is the Champions League. This isn't, you know, some sort of, you know, you know, trash league. At the end of the day, this is the best of the best. So if you do give up mistakes and, you know, have and there's costly errors, at the end of the day, you're going to get punished. And that's what happened. And obviously, I've got to give a shout out to your mate, Har your mate Harry. Um, uh, at the end of the day, like his traditional penalty run up is the traditional just run and bang. But he made Raya sit down for five minutes there and then, you know, slotted it coolly in the net and typical celebration. I just was hoping I wouldn't see it. But at the end of the day, um, me and Wes know that he's guaranteed to score a goal. He loves playing against Arsenal. So um, I think on the basis of the game, um, I think I'm quite disappointed because I think, you know, the fact that the two goals were gifts, I think Arsenal could have got a result out of there. And I think Ben White missed a really huge chance to put us 2-0 ahead. That could mm -hmm. change, you know, the game entirely if he actually puts that away. And obviously you've got the end of the game, which we'll get into, but... Um, I'll let you guys talk about it first before you come back to me about how that kind of ended. And also, actually, something that happened in the game, too, that people haven't actually discussed a lot either. So, yeah. No, and I think you make some, some valid points. Obviously, I, I love the bit you talk about Harry Kane. And I think you're right in terms of the way he struck that ball, because it was almost like he knew that Kane was going to smack it, but instead he just decided to let him move and pop it in the other corner, which I think was very clever from Kane. But we will talk about, obviously, that that bit that uh, Nelson was alluding to, Wes. And that was obviously the bit at the end, right at the end of the mm -hmm. game, where yeah. Saka is obviously, he's gone into the keeper, and you're thinking, is it a pen? Is it not? What is your kind of take on it? Um, put it this way, I think I was surprised it wasn't given initially. Um, and then I was probably equally as surprised that VAR haven't really stepped in and just kind of made the referee sort of have a look. Because I think if the referee was to have another look, I would probably argue that Arsenal get a penalty. Um, it's one of those where certainly in the Premier League in particular, you would more often than not see them given like nine, nine and a half times out of ten. Um, doesn't excuse the fact that Saka decided to turn into the Black Tom Daly um, because that dive was just absolutely like outrageous um, in terms of the way he's gone down. But there's definitely contact there. I think the key is whether I think there's two probably key points is whether Neuer steps his leg out far enough um, and whether Saka then moves his leg in towards Neuer's leg. I think that is that is that, and I think potentially VAR have then gone. Well, that's subjective, so we can't overly get involved too much. And I think this is why VAR in Europe has worked a lot better than it has in the Premier League, in particular, because again, like I mentioned, in the Premier League, you know, VAR is checking that, and the referee is going to the monitor to have a look. Like one hundred percent, there's no doubt about that. Um, whereas, and it felt like there was obviously other decisions that were going on in the game and you're like, Ooh, VAR are going to get involved here and they didn't. So they're not there almost to re-referee the game. They're there to support the on-pitch referee. Whereas it feels like in the Premier League, 
VAR is almost there to like re-referee the game. Um, so I think that's potentially the the sort of main differences for me. But I was I was surprised to see it not given. Um, that is probably what I would what I would say to sort of uh, sum that up. I think that's the thing because when I first saw it, I was like, "Oh no, they're going to get given a penalty." Um, but obviously, then when you rewatch it, like you say, it's a bit of a grey area in terms of has he has he gone over and too much in terms of a dive? Has he hit Noyer's leg? I mean, Nelson, how did you kind of sit? Are you on the same wavelength as Wes, or are you completely different? I just want to point out first that that ball wasn't even intended for Saka because Thomas Pye actually hit a wayward pass. So when that ball went through, I said, how has that gone there? And then Saka is the only one that's reacted to get to that. So you're like, oh my gosh, okay, 95th minute, something could happen. In my honest opinion, when I play football, I play. I, I would like to hope that players play it the honest way. And the problem I have with Saka is the fact that he stuck out is his basically that that right leg of his when in all honesty if you really think about it if he plays honest he goes around the keeper he's still on his feet and could bag that and it's three two and you're looking at it a totally different scenario um yes Wes made a really good point about Neuer potentially sticking out his leg and uh, in the Premier League we have bit, seen that given um so obviously us being Premier League fans and seeing that you're you're, you're kind of expecting the consistency to continue in Europe but it is different in Europe in my opinion so I, for one, I am not one of those deluded fans. I actually think it wasn't a penalty. Um, and obviously, there also was another decision in the game that many people haven't spoken about where it actually should have been a penalty against Arsenal. Um, and I actually think it was because I actually looked back at it and I was like, wow, it actually was a penalty. And you could argue that Bayern were robbed as well. So, I mean, it's very sticky in Europe, but... Uh, looking back at the decision, I mean, I think 2-2 was a fair result considering that Bayern didn't get their decision and then obviously Arsenal could make a case, but in my opinion, not really. But I think 2-2 was a fair result um, looking at the game. I think that's the thing. Maybe it was a terms of, oh no, we've made a mistake in-game, we can't go and change that now. I know they shouldn't do this, but maybe it was kind of levelling it out, that makes sense. Because obviously, Wes, that incident that Nelson's talking about, obviously I think it was um, they were going to take a goal kick. And then, I can't remember the other player, but he picks up the ball and then retakes the goal kick. Yeah, it was Gabriel, wasn't it? So Raya's sort of played as effectively like your free pass to to sort of, you know play out from the back. Um, Gabriel picks the ball up. Um, I don't actually think I spotted it at the time, um, but it was more in the aftermath of it um, that it's sort of been brought to light. And you, yeah, I think everybody now is of the opinion, well, that should have been a penalty to Bayern Munich. Um, I think Tuchel came out afterwards and kind of said that the referee said it was a child's mistake, but not something that he's going to pull up in a Champions League game. But there's a lot at stake in, in these Champions League games, um, not, not least in terms of prize money and everything else. Um, but there is a lot at stake in, in these games. You know, for example, you know, as Nelson alluded to earlier, Bayern aren't having the best run in the league at the moment. So you could argue that Bayern's Champions League run is effectively keeping Thomas Tuchel in his job at the moment. I know he's leaving at the end of the season, but... Bayern could have pulled the trigger a lot earlier, but they may be waiting to see how they do in the Champions League. But then if Bayern Munich go out now in the second leg, they'll feel really hard done by because of that particular incident. Um, and that could then see Tuchel potentially losing his job a little bit sooner than than you know him leaving at the end of the season. So yeah, there are really sort of small and fine margins that we that we're living by in in not just football but the world of sport. And you know, they're they're those types of things that are really key for people to effectively stay stay in their jobs or, or lose their jobs, you know. So, yeah, it was a it was an interesting one. Um, yeah, and I think Bayern, obviously, I think at the time were were feeling aggrieved, and I think they're feeling even more so, more aggrieved now because of it. Um, but yeah, I think it's just one. It was just a strange, strange thing that happened. So, I think that could have been why it's been brushed under the carpet initially um and then like i say in the aftermath it's like oh right okay this has happened blimey it does mean that obviously the return picture is going to be even tastier in that kind of sense so that'd be a good one to check out for but obviously there was another champions league game on last night nelson that was obviously real madrid and city what did you take of that game because that again that was a mad one to watch too Whoever decided to put these two fixtures at the same time needs to go, like, they need to rot because that was horrific. That's just, yeah, we were robbed of obviously seeing two great games on separate occasions. But 
I think if you're any football fan, that's just a treat. And as a neutral, that is a treat. And that Real Madrid City game was full of absolute worldies. Um, and I want to obviously talk about one of my favourite goals of the night, which is obviously <laughs> Prince Philip now becoming king and announcing <laughs> himself on the world stage, in my opinion. And me and Wes are really big fans of Phil Foden. But that goal there, I think this season, you look at his his output and you're just like, OK, he's he's I think mentally... His mentality has taken another, has gone to another level. I think Pep's got something else out of him this season and he's just producing consistently now. And it's really good to see, especially as, obviously as England fans as well, looking forward to the European Championships. I think it's going to be really well for us um, as well, um, having that firepower from Phil. Um, it was a great game, full of great goals. Um, it's actually surprising because I think I was hoping the battle would be between Phil and Jude Bellingham. But you could argue Jude Bellingham in that game really didn't have much to say. Whereas Phil Foden definitely came out, especially in that second half, because City were 2-1 down. And I think Pep did really well to make the adjustments that he made. And then City just kind of came out firing. And we're probably unlucky if it wasn't for a great finish by Valverde for that. That volley was outrageous to make it 3-3. So, um, yeah, I think Madrid, Madrid are a special one. When it comes to Madrid and Champions League, you never know. Uh, for them, I mean, we know it's, you know, Don Carlo in charge. But for me, when it comes to Madrid, when you look back at their history in Champions League, you think individual brilliance. I think that team is full of individual players that can produce moments at any sort of time. Um, and I think that's just been their history. And I think you've got to give up to them to still be, you know, level at 3-3, going back to the Etihad. I think they are definitely thinking of back to last year where City smacked them in the semis and using that as motivation to... Um, kind of do City over this season. But we'll wait and see. I think the second league is going to be very, very juicy. But as a neutral kind of, you know, looking back at the goals and seeing that game, I thought, what a treat. So great game of football. You make a great point again, obviously, because they've got to go there. And it's like the arsenal Bayern game again. It's And I'm hoping, Wes, I mean, hoping they don't put them on the same time again. Is, do you reckon that's going to be the case because they played at the same time for the first leg? Yeah, I think they will. And uh, I'm, in, I'm in Camp Nelson with this one because I'm absolutely raging. I'm not saying no disservice to the games that are, are on tonight, but you would argue the two quarterfinals, if you like, that are what well, you would argue the top pick games on the same night, you're there going like, seriously, come on, come on. Like, sort, it, sort yourselves out. But yeah, I have a feeling that they're going to be on the same night again. Um, which means that we're as us as viewers and, and neutral fans will have to will have to pick us as Tottenham fans. Do we do we watch our mate Harry and uh, yeah. you know produce another masterclass, sit another goalie down, or you know do we do we watch um, you know Real Madrid and, and, and Man City? You know that you, you could kind of argue you know between both games, and I think if you had a the choice for a split screen, I think every fan would have had. Would have had the split screen out um last night so yeah i think the goals were just of real high quality um last night and i, I want to credit also bernardo silva for that free kick because how many times would you have seen just the standards cross into the box yeah go and attack it but yeah bernardo silva quick thinking to go goalies near post the goalkeepers had a shocker as well let's be honest um he's got to be he's got to be sort of saving that he's been beating at his near post standard thing for a goalkeeper you know you never want to be beaten at your near post so yeah look we're in last night was cracking let i wonder what uh the following night in terms of tonight will have um in store for us as fans because it may it's got to live up to to the billing of, of last night in terms of drama and excitement um for sure I think you make some great, uh, great mm. points there, Wes. And like you said, Nelson, coming into tonight's games, again, obviously for a neutral fan, that's not being in the Champions League. How are you kind of watching it? And how you, obviously, you don't want to think too far ahead in case Bayern do knock you out. But what kind of teams are you kind of iron up? Or who would you want to play, say, in the next round? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I personally wouldn't want Atletico Madrid. I think they're a nightmare in the Champions League. That Diego Simeone seems to know how to do it every time in Europe, whether it's reaching the semi-finals or getting a finals berth. He seems to know how to get it done, and I just think Atletico are very just like in your face. And um, I personally wouldn't want them. I think out of all the teams, I think all I think Dortmund is probably the team that many would probably scream for. Um, not doing well in the Bundesliga. I see Wes making a little face there. Maybe he disagrees with me a bit, but you know. 
it, I think Dortmund could be a team that some people want. Even PSG, you could argue PSG as well is a team that many people might want to consider. I think looking, especially when you look at the bracket on the side of you know City, Arsenal, Bayern Munich, and Real Madrid, people are expecting the winner to come from that that side, whereas the other side, people are not expecting you know a, an eventual champion. I'm, I'm, I, I think me personally, I wouldn't want Atletico Madrid. I think out of the teams that are remaining, I would personally want uh, Dortmund. I think Dortmund would be a team. But I'd like to hear your take, Wes. I see you make a face. Tell me, tell me what your what your views are. So put it this way: if I'm in an Arsenal situation, I think you're spot on in terms of the team to avoid is Atletico Madrid because they will sit, they will frustrate you, they will get in your, they will literally wind you lot up. And I don't think the Arsenal team has the maturity to deal with it um, in the same way that perhaps the City team has in terms of, you know, experience and, and things like that. Um, I would argue that Arsenal would be happy should it occur to face Barcelona because this isn't the Barcelona of old. Um, and I think as, uh, yeah, of course, individual players, your Gavis, your Pedris, players like that, your Mal, you know, Barcelona still have those. But I think as a team, I think they're they're definitely one to be got at. Um, this this Barcelona team, obviously, we know they're they're a bit of a mess um, financially, and I think that's massively taking its toll on the pitch as well. They can't seem to just get things right on the pitch. They almost want to go back to, and they almost want to start again. But it feels like they're chasing their tail and having to compete with Real Madrid in terms of having to sign a superstar um every every year uh which seems to be the done thing Dortmund's an interesting one for me because again I think they've still got that individual quality and again like it feels like with the German teams in particular they may not have the strongest domestic seasons but when it comes to these like European games it's when they really step up um and I feel that will be the way with with Dortmund um I know their group was a bit manic obviously with AC Milan and Newcastle in there um, it was all sort of happening and going on. But, yeah, I think if I, if it was me as an Arsenal fan, I'm glad I'm not, by the way, but, you know, um, I would I would seriously want to avoid Atletico. Um, but I think, yeah, Barca, PSG, Dortmund. Dortmund is an interesting one, like I say. But, yeah, I'd, I'd, out of that side of the draw, my probably pick would be to, to take on would be Barcelona. I know there's a bit of a romantic feeling there with Arteta going back home but yeah I would if I was an Arsenal fan I wouldn't be scared of taking on Barcelona like I would have been and like you would have been now also a good few years ago when when that did happen and, and Messi scored four against you lot yeah I mean hopefully it doesn't get to that point you know and uh Payne manages to smack a couple of goals against you the next leg but be interesting to see how it all goes down but it's quite nice to talk about the Champions League obviously with us as this year not having it but we're going to move on and bring it back to Tottenham uh, because uh, we do have a fixture at the weekend, obviously against New <laughs> Newcastle. And uh, Tottenham Tears has come in right at the good time uh, to yeah. see us preview this one and whether we can potentially beat them. So, Wes, I'm going to let you take the floor first uh, and then we'll come to Nelson. <sighs> but how do you see this one going down? I'm going to whack up the, the tactics board just in case you want to use it and fiddle with it. Yeah, um, this is going to be really interesting. I don't know which Newcastle we're going to play, whether it be their first team, their under 23s or their under 12s, because um, they've got that many players out um, at the moment. Um, their injury list is like ridiculous. Um, so, yeah, it's probably up there, I would say, in terms of Luton, um, in terms of them having like the most players currently out injured in the Premier League. I think Luton have got about 12 or 13. I think Newcastle are right up there as well. Um, but yeah, I would argue that it's probably going to set up Newcastle, obviously, in the black, which is quite handy. Um, back, like, 4 2 3 one, Eddie Howe, sort of trusted go-to sort of formation. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of who <laughs> Newcastle can get out on the pitch. Uh, Bruno would probably be in there, Longstaff. I don't know if Joel Linton's back. Um, I know Gordon may or may not be suspended as well, which would be a real boost um, for us. Because um, I think Anthony Gordon's been wicked this year. Um, I would expect Isak to be up top um, and a player who I really like and I'm definitely sure will cause Romero in particular a few problems. Um, it's just whether he decides to keep himself on there or whether Mickey kind of um, yeah helps out helps out his mate 
um, in there. And then for Spurs, I was actually really, really impressed. I don't know about you, Holly, at the weekend with the contributions of um, Hoiberg and Bentoncourt. Mm-hmm. I think they really, really changed the game. Um, so if it was me, I would be looking at Hoiberg, uh, Bentoncourt, and for me, La Celso. I think he, he deserves a shout. Madison, for me, since he's come back from his injury, been really wasteful in possession. Always trying to find that killer pass, um, that eye of a needle pass when he doesn't need to. Um, and then times where he plays it simple when he could have found that killer pass. Um, so, yeah, that's who my midfield would be. And I think we could probably do with a little bit of a freshen up in there um, as well. I feel like the front three kind of is what it is at the moment. Um yeah, in terms of Werner, Son and, and Brennan Johnson, I think that would probably be my pick. A lot of pace in there. I think Ange likes, obviously, pace up towards the top end of the pitch. Um, and I think that could really cause Newcastle's back for some 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 problems and some issues. So, yeah, I'm not sure if Livramento's back yet. Um, if not, it'll be Emil Kraft, potentially, unless he plays centre-half. Lewis Hall could play left-back. Uh, Dan Byrne, probably the only fit. Not only centre half, the only fit outfield player for Newcastle, bless him, um, at the at the moment. So uh, yeah, although I did want to mention Holly, I don't know about you, um, what's happened to Oliver Skip? Um, because the guy just seems to have fallen off a cliff, and it's a bit worrying for me because when he was in the team, um, he especially under Conte, he was really really good. I know he had his injury, and then yeah, we've just not seen him this year under under. He's Ant, no Harry Winks bit... though. So. Well, I did have a fear. I did have a fear that Skip would be would turn into Harry Winks, but I thought like when he did play for us, obviously under Nuno and Conte and stuff like that, he was really good. And yeah, I think Mr. Skip's been been missed. I'm just like, where are you, Skippy? Like, do you know what I mean? And considering we have an Australian in charge and he's dropping someone called Skippy, do you know what I mean? There's, there's just it's like, what's going on here, Ange? Yeah, what's going on here, Ange? But it, it, like you say, it is it is strange because um, I think, like you said, it just seemed to have fallen off the, the face of the earth. Very strange. Um, but you made some good points about how we set up because, Nelson, uh, obviously there's been a lot of talk about Basuma, a lot of talk about Madison. And like Wes alluded to, the fact that obviously Madison hasn't been back to his A game um, since his injury. Do you think it's about time Spurs give the likes of Lo Celso a little go? Yeah, when Wes brought up Lo Celso instead of Madison, um, I was actually intrigued because, yeah, you would argue just because of the name and what Madison brings to the squad and his qualities, you just insert him in there regardless, you know, probably what um, and she's in training and what, and, you know, just just Madison as a player, we know how good he can be. Um, so you give him the benefit of the doubt. But, you know, considering how Newcastle might likely set up and I think sometimes you got to look to other players potentially who could bring something different, a different dynamic. Um, and Lo Celso can do that. I think there's been times this season where he, he's been able to do that. And obviously that game against City is the one that comes to mind straight away, how he was able to, you know, you know it was a lovely equaliser, by the way, but it was just something that he was able to bring a different dynamic when when needed to. And I think Madison just hasn't been up to scratch since um, coming back from injury. Um, I love him as a player, personally. I would have taken him, I think, any other club, you know, when he left Leicester, would have taken uh, Madison, but um, obviously he went to, to Spurs, had a really great start to the season, but sometimes it just happens as a player. You just got to bring it, that injury happens and it's just that mentality to kind of get yourself back. So I'm sure Andrew's doing his best to encourage him and just, you know, kind of remind James of how great he is and what he brings to the team. Um, it could be a case where, you know, starting someone like Gio and then bringing on James, James who could, you know, make that impact could be the difference maker uh, on 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 the weekend, um, and I mean I expect a win considering how Wes mentioned that joke that he made at the beginning, like well, who Newcastle could play. You know you don't know who they're going to play because um, they've really suffered this season. So um, I to answer your question, Holly, I think um, yeah I think Big Ash should probably consider starting someone else other than uh, Madison, but we'll see if he does it. We'll see. We will, and I think that's the thing. I think. Now, Wes, with Tottenham, it's almost like we're getting to that stage where we hope we would be, where we've got that squad depth, but we've actually got players with quality. Yes, there's a few players now that 
okay, maybe we can try and ship out in the summer or keep them but get better replacements to start in that first team. But it almost feels like the final pieces of the jigsaw are coming together, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think Ange made the point as well after the um, Forest game because obviously he made those two changes at half time, and uh, I think the journalist was asking um, what the reason behind that was. And Ange went, well, I've got a bit of a squad now, so I thought I'd use it. Um, but yeah, I think I was watching Hoiberg, and like I said a minute ago, I was really impressed by him. And then it kind of dawned on me that, you know, I'm going to miss this guy. Like, this is the kind of Hoiberg that I, I I liked watching. Like, he was willing to take responsibility for the ball in possession. He, you know, broke play up when he needed to, was good and smart in his decision-making on the ball. Um, where there has been times with Hoiberg where he has seriously frustrated me. Like, he's been hiding, he doesn't want to get on the ball, especially when trying to play out from the back. Um, not just this season under Ange, but previously um, under Conte and, and Mourinho and, and stuff like that as well. So it was just a nice, refreshing kind of performance to see from Hoiberg in particular. And it was like, oh, I'm probably going to miss this guy because, you know, it's likely that he's he's going to be moved on in the in the summer. So, um, but yeah, it's just nice, I think, for us to have options. Um, and like you say, and I think the biggest thing that I've noticed this year, probably more than most, is the squad players, when they've been given an opportunity, more often than not have really taken it. Um, you know, how many times, again, sort of under Conte and, and Mourinho in particular, like the, the squad players were getting game time and you're watching it and going, it ended up being a chore to watch the to watch Spurs. And it was like, you, the guys are just not taking their opportunities. So, you know, they're begging for the manager to play. And then when they get an opportunity, they don't take it. And the manager then goes like, well, I've given you an opportunity. You didn't show me anything. So there's a reason why I can't start you any, in any of these other games. Um, but yeah, I think that's been the the nice thing for me to see um, this year is is that the squad players more often than not have uh, have taken their chance. And I know Nelson mentioned uh, Geo's uh, equaliser at the at the empty ad, which was absolute limbs in the uh, in the away end uh, that evening as well. Even though it was bloody cold in Manchester, I mean, when is it not? Um, but yeah, that was absolute limbs in that uh, in that away end. But yeah, I think Geo deserves a chance for me. Like he he brings something different to the team, to the midfield. A uh, lot of good energy in there, and yeah, I think Madders just needs. I wouldn't say a bit of a rocket or whatever, but I think Madders just needs that little reminder of you're not indispensable and you can be dropped. Um, and look, we have an international who's more than able to sort of come in and, and take your place. So just keep him on his toes a little bit, I think. I think that's the thing. Maybe just needs a reset, I think. It just needs yeah. to like, chill out a bit. But Nelson, obviously, I hate <clears throat> comparing Tottenham and Arsenal. But I feel like you, we're heading in the same direction as in you're just a, maybe a couple of seasons ahead of us uh, when we've started this rebuild. So for you, obviously, trying to put yourselves in a Spurs fans view, I'm pretty sure I've asked you this before. But what would you say to, to anybody that's kind of thinking to themselves, OK, if we don't have a great summer or things aren't kind of working how I want them to work under Ange. What would you kind of say to him? Because in hindsight, you've kind of had that with Arteta for, for a number of years. Yeah, we have. It's a good point, Holly. Um, and I think, again, I think I said it a couple of weeks ago, just, you know, the fact that I think the Spurs fans, I think, would like to see the board get behind Ange. I think that is probably the biggest indicator from, for any football fan that supports their club, knowing that, okay, you know, regardless of what the fans think, us as a board, we've made our choice and we're going to stick behind um, the gaffer. So I think if the board do that and if it, you know, sometimes it's in a, an, an, an extension that can happen. But I believe that, yeah, I think the, the board comes out and probably supports. I mean, they will, likely won't say anything, but I think it's kind of an indicator when they know that if, let's say, for instance, next season, you know, there you guys go on a run where it's a bit rocky, it's a bit shaky, similar to what Arsenal had when Arteta, I think, finished eight in his second um, full season. Um, I think the board came out and actually said that, no, we're, this is what we want. We want to stick. This is our man. We want to stick with him. So I think that's something that I think the fans would appreciate knowing that, OK, you know, the board have made that choice and this is who we're going to go with. And I think it's just the matter of then you know, backing that up and actually supporting him in the summer. Um, Arsenal, I know, did have some summers where they couldn't get everyone, but I think it was the intention of buying the players and having a clear identity of how they wanted to grow 
obviously buying players that were Premier League proven under the age of 25, that that, that was a clear plan. And um, over time, it just kind of kind of built and built and built. And obviously now, like you mentioned, kind of seasons ahead, probably, you know, I think probably way ahead, probably what Arteta probably thought he'd be at. I think probably the season after was probably the season he thought, you know, would probably be challenging. But now you've got him actually competing. You've got to give credit to that. And I think it's only a matter of time before Spurs, if when making the right choices, it, I think fans will love to see the identity. And I think one thing you mentioned, Wes, was the fact that, you know, you know, squad depth, actually having that squad depth and actually players actually coming in and taking the opportunity now. Whereas, you know, other, you know, managers before and past, it's probably, sometimes you could argue that managers create a divide between like, this is the first team players, you guys are the bench and that's it. Like you guys are probably not up to scratch, but I'll bring you on, you know, if, if I need to. Whereas I think Big Ange, like I think one thing I'm noticing is building that culture where everyone is involved. There is, nobody is kind of like indispensable. Like at the end of the day, um, every, everything is up for grabs and I think that is a good thing and I think that builds a really good culture and mentality you know when building the club uh, to win trophies in the future 100% I really hope so that we win a trophy soon because uh, as we know it didn't work under Jose Mourinho don't work wonder no, didn't work under Conte uh, hopefully it'll work under Ange but like I say it's nice to get your kind of viewpoint Nelson because as much as I hate Arsenal they are a little bit ahead of us in terms of the way they but it hasn't been easy for them and I know that we're only just started this journey and seeing and things are looking pretty good at the moment so hopefully that continues but you know what it's been amazing uh to spend this evening with you guys dissecting more than just Tottenham uh tonight which is always good fun but like I always say before we go uh this show uh is sponsored by Kofa so once again I'm gonna let Wes do his thing far away my friend Oh. Yeah, so Kofa or Kickoff Football Academy, Milton Keynes, once Holly's put it back on, thank you, Holly, um, <laughs> is a football coaching business um, or coaching setup in uh, the Milton Keynes area. So if you have any young girls or boys who are wanting to have any extra training, um, develop their footballing skills, develop themselves even as people, um, get in touch with us because we would love to help your your child along their, their footballing journey. Um, we have lots and lots of sessions such as one-on-ones, holiday camps, uh, skill centre, mini kickers, um, etc. So yeah, please do get in touch with us because we would love to help your child along their, their footballing journey. Holly, you're on mute. <laughs> you think by now I know what I'm bloody doing um, but no thank you Wes for that uh, again go check out Kofa on all the socials I'm going to go to Nelson first to say his goodbyes so Nelson where can everybody find you my friend uh, you can find me on Instagram guys uh, at uh, nnatumba25 so that's N N T U M B A 25 on Instagram amazing right. stuff thank you again Nelson and also Wes I've left it till last for you to do your outro. So far away, my friend. Here we go. Twitter's at Wezo10, unofficial Moose Then Bele fan account. Everybody knows that by now. I am sure, but it's for those that don't and are watching for the very first time. So if you are, make sure you like the video and obviously subscribe to Holly. You've hit 3K yet or not, Holly? Oh, we're getting there slowly. <laughs> getting there slowly. So we need to get Holly to 3K, hopefully before the end of the season. That will be fab. Um, and then Instagram is at Wezo32. I'm usually at a Spurs game somewhere, although because of the scheduling, obviously on Sunday I wasn't there. Um, so, yeah, don't talk to me about that, basically. Um, but I hope to be at uh, the next Spurs home game, um, whenever that is. I think it's the North London derby, actually. So, yeah, I'm definitely not missing that one for anything. Um, and then, where, where else am I? Oh, uh, Kofa, MK or Kickoff Football Academy across your socials um, for all the football coaching stuff. And then because um, Holly bullied me into doing football content videos, uh, it's at WM32Football on Twitter, YouTube, TikTok um, for topical football content. I've been a bit quiet, but I will get onto it um, relatively soon. So, yeah, I just need to find some time in the diary uh, to get some stuff done. But Holly, that's it. It's a wrap. Love it. Thank you. Again, thank you both Wes and Nelson. I do really like doing these Wednesday shows now that I actually turn up. So thank you for putting up with me. Um, but it is good fun. And like I say, thank you to everybody uh, that's in the chat as well. You've been lively tonight, so thank you very much. Uh, we'll be back Monday for another Holly Totspurs Live and then we'll be back here next Wednesday, same place, same time. So make sure you subscribe so you never miss a video. And until next time, I will use Oh, 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 oh,